polls out. Well, I told you earlier in the week that uh, by the end of the week, Trump would be leading in Ohio and Florida. And now, when I did my prediction of uh, how the election was going to go, I had Trump winning Ohio and Florida. I told you at the time that Hillary Clinton was leading in both of those states. Now, that was the beginning of the week. The end of the week is only a couple of days later. It's not like, boom, all of a sudden he's going to be losing in Ohio and Florida, right? I mean, that was too outrageous a prediction. So uh, let's go to the polls and find out what happened. Polls from both uh, Bloomberg Politics and CNN in Ohio give Trump a five-point lead over Hillary Clinton. Not just the lead, a five-point lead. Okay. Uh, a second CNN poll uh, in Florida this time finds Trump up by three points. 47 to 44 with Johnson taking 6% and Stein 1%. So here we are, just a couple of days later, and Trump leads in Florida and Ohio. Okay. Uh, now let's go to a third swing state he needs to win, and I also have a winning. Uh, and again, she was leading in this state just a couple of days ago. A new Monmouth University poll out on Wednesday showed Trump leading by two points among likely voters in Nevada. Bad news. So, uh, polls were already trending in the wrong direction. Hillary Clinton had a disastrous weekend. Now that everybody saw. It's not like I was the genius who figured out she had a really bad weekend. Uh, so, uh, but yet, and the reason I do this is because the rest of the media is still in denial. The rest of the establishment, the elites, the pundits, all of them in denial. They think Hillary Clinton's going to win, that that is, uh, it's taken as a given, uh, and um, if you made them bet on it, they would all bet landslides still today. <laughs> She's losing Ohio and Florida, and by a lot. <laughs> Look, you might say three to five points is not a lot, but like when Hillary Clinton was up by two points at one point in Ohio and Florida, all the papers were talking about like, oh, so it's over. See, we told you, Hillary Clinton, of course, is going to win those states. So a two-point lead is gigantic for Hillary Clinton, but a five-point lead is small for Donald Trump. You're in denial. You're in denial. He's leading in those states. It's real. Okay. Uh, why? Independent voters uh, tipped to Trump 45 to 40 percent. Only the Democrats that had a candidate earlier that did really, really well with independent voters instead of really terribly with independent voters. But when we tried to warn them, oh, no, no. The establishment knows everything. We know Hillary Clinton's going to win easy. She's the better candidate, even though all the polling showed the opposite. Well, gee, I wonder who was right. Okay, uh, now, uh, another problem uh, that Hillary Clinton has and why she's slipping even further. Clinton is ahead of Trump among voters under 30, but she is not getting the level of support Barack Obama received in 2012. 48% of young voters are currently backing her, while Obama won 60% of the young vote in 2012. Only 29% of uh, voters are supporting Trump, young voters, but 21% say they'll vote for someone else or won't vote. Or won't vote. I wonder if there was another Democratic candidate who did really w well with young voters and could have picked up all those votes and actually beaten Trump fairly easily. Hmm. But look, it's not about sour grapes. Okay, what's done is done. I... I I'm asking you guys, and I'm not just the audience, but the rest of the people in the media, open your eyes a little bit, because if you open your eyes, what you see is Donald Trump leading. So, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, it doesn't help the situation. And it's not just the pundits that I'm talking to, it's not just the Democratic Party establishment, but you guys in the audience, too. Oh, no, it's big deal, man, it's, oh, yeah, you know, Hillary Clinton sucks, and uh, what difference does it make who I vote for? I agree with you that Hillary Clinton sucks. I just said that, right? Um, that doesn't mean that Donald Trump doesn't suck harder and that your vote is irrelevant because, ah, yeah, what difference? Well, okay, we're going to get Donald Trump as president and then we'll see what kind of a difference it makes. He's leading in Ohio and Florida. It's real. Now, let me give you some semblance, but it's almost every article, but I'll give you one from the Huffington Post that goes to show you the attitude of the rest of the media. Like, no, it's not really real. Come on. <laughs> None of my friends are voting for Donald Trump. He can't possibly win. So this is written by Ariel Edwards Levy. She writes, it's rarely a good idea to look at any survey in the absence of context. Even good pollsters can differ substantially, and it's often difficult to predict whose picture of the electorate will be 
more on the mark. Both CNN's and Bloomberg's polls in Ohio, for instance, show an electorate that's notably more Republican than that of some uh, other recent surveys. Here we are again. Anytime Donald Trump takes the lead, I don't know if you can't rely on the poll. How many times have I shown you this? Go back and look. Half a dozen, a dozen times. Whenever he takes the lead, every guy, every person in the media is like, I don't know if you have polls. You can't trust the poll. Every time she takes the lead, I'll look at commandingly. Commanding. They're still writing about it like uh, she's, uh, you know, Trump has put a dent in Hillary Clinton's lead. Yes, she, she leads in the national polling. She used to leave on average. Uh, by about 10 points. Now, that was a real lead. Now it's down to 5, and some polls 4. Okay, that's still a lead. That's still very real. But it's, it is withering. So that part is accurate. But remember, we don't vote nationally. We, it's an electoral college. So if you're losing Florida and Ohio, are you really leading? Now, according to my calculations, since I believe she's going to win Pennsylvania, Colorado, and Virginia, she would still eke out a victory. But that is no sure thing. Okay, so let me give you more from... Having the post. But the results offer increasing evidence that polling has tightened since the days of Clinton's more commanding leads over the summer. It's not really a lead if you're losing the Electoral College. Okay, let's keep going. Another question is to what extent the swings represent genuine shifts in public opinion. One theory, called the differential non-response, argues that shifts in public polling are overstated and often reflect a change not in what voters think, but in how likely they are to answer a survey at that particular moment gobbledygook, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. In other words, whenever a poll comes out, or a whole number of polls comes out showing Trump's in the lead, I'm not going to see it, I'm not going to hear it, I'm not going to speak of it. No, 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 Trump can't win, Trump can't win, so these polls must be lying. They're not lying, and he's in very good shape right now, and Hillary Clinton is not. But yet, the hubris of the Clinton machine will not change. Be human for a change. Try something different. But no, they won't. They won't. Oh, uh, well, just smile and tell everybody pretty little stories. Hey, by the way, you know what Remind me what you're running for. I'll give you time. I'm with her. It's not a thing. That's not a thing that you run for. Like, for example, you know why Bernie Sanders was running. I wanted him to care more about campaign finance, and he did, and he really uh, realized the importance of that, and he fought for it, et cetera. But really, what drives him is income inequality. And you know it, and he's been fighting for it for 40 years. You know why Bernie was running, okay? Trump's a madman. He's running for his ego. I got it, right? You don't need to convince me of Trump. Hillary Clinton, what are you running for? I'll give you more time. Hillary Clinton supporters, I know you're with her, and we're stronger together, whatever that means. But what are we running for? Why does Hillary Clinton want to lead? If, if I was going to run for president, which would be hilarious, I know. Uh, but I, I'm driven to get money out of politics. Because if we don't get money out of politics, we can't get our democracy back. I care about that. What does Hillary Clinton care about? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know? Does she know? Has she communicated that to the American people? One last time. You're losing. You're not winning. There's less than two months before the election. Clinton campaign, snap out of it. You think that you are inevitable? I think you might not misunderstand that word. You think you can't lose? Go back to 2008 and see how you got your ass handed to you. Wakey, wakey. You're losing to... And by the way, you're not just losing to a Republican. You're losing to a monstrous Republican. A guy that anybody off the street can be. But you're losing to him. Jesus Christ, man. Tell the American people why you want to be president. How are you going to help them? How are you going to help them? How are you going to fix the country? More of the same is the worst platform I have ever seen. We told you that the American people hate the establishment. What did you do? You picked the most establishment candidate there was. And now her the strategy is, I'm, I'm just going to let Trump do his thing. I'm just sit here and tell you, so you should be with me. I, I don't know why. I'm not, I don't know where I'm driving, but you should be with me. So establishment rocks. The worst campaign idea I've ever seen. Good luck with that. Way to screw over the entire country. Together we can change the media. Make it more representative of you and not the powerful. Come join us. Make a difference. TYTnetwork.com slash join.
They're a reassuring voice during tough times. They guide us through the events of our lives and explain the unexplainable. They are the pros. We feel like we know them. And the more we go through together, the more we do. Some people believe that uh, it'll make no difference at all who uh, wins this race. Um, I'm not in that camp. I'm in the camp that Hillary Clinton is the establishment. I can't stand it. I want to fight against it, and I will fight against it. I fought against it in the primaries, and if she wins, I'll uh, start the fight on day one. Okay? Because I don't believe the establishment is going to bring us any change. Now, if you think that that proves, that's it. That's the end of the equation. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the equation because there is someone else that is the other likely alternative, and his name is Donald Trump. Now, is he worse? That's a call you're going to have to make, but let me inform you of uh, what he thinks before you make that call. So, who might he put on the Supreme Court? Now, he put out a BS list earlier, and it was clearly made up by other Republicans of 11 uh, guys that are current sitting judges that he might consider. You don't think Donald Trump knows any of those judges? He doesn't know. He had a staffer put that together because it would be acceptable to conservatives. When he was asked earlier, way early in the process, who he would consider for a uh, Supreme Court justice, he had said, Judge Napolitano. Yes, the guy on Fox News, yes. Because all he does is watch TV. All he knows is his buddies. And so he's going to pick one of his buddies. And he knows Napolitano and he sees him on TV. We're lucky he's not going to pick Judge Judy. Okay, so now the news report is, well, he's classed it up a little bit. He's not going to go with Napolitano. Two different sources, one inside the Thiel camp, one inside the Trump camp, saying he's considering Peter Thiel. Okay, I'm going to explain who Peter Thiel is in a second, but first let me give you the facts on this story. Donald Trump has made it clear he will nominate Peter Thiel to the Supreme Court if he wins the presidency. Thiel has told friends, according to a source, close to the PayPal co-founder. So that's your source inside uh, Thiel's camp saying that's what Trump told him. Now, the source inside the Trump camp also confirms it, but says, and as Huffington Post in this case explains, a separate source close to Trump, who has not spoken to Trump directly about Thiel being nominated to the court, cautioned that Trump's offers often fail to materialize in real life. Now, so that's very fair, and I give that to you as a caveat. Trump, he'll think that today, he'll think something else tomorrow. It's not like it wasn't real today. In his ADD mind, it was real that day. Well, somebody else would come in and say, why don't you make Roger Ailes Chief Justice? He'd be like, okay, that's not a good idea. I'll do that. Right? So, uh, but it's real enough that both camps are having these conversations. Okay. And he says Trump never uh, uh, thinks a deal is real anyway. He thinks he prides himself on reneging on deals. Maybe he said that to Thiel's camp so that Thiel would go and give a speech about him uh, at the uh, RNC, which he did. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, Peter Thiel side says, no, 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 no. Peter hasn't had any conversations about a Supreme Court nomination, has no interest in the job. That's a very standard denial that you get from a spokesperson. Okay. Well, let's find out who Peter Thiel is. Because I seem to be concerned about him. Should you be concerned? Okay. He has $2.7 billion. He's a famous investor out of Silicon Valley. Uh, so, okay, God bless, good success. Uh, he was one of the first investors in Facebook. Nice job, okay? And I don't take that away from him, and there are different things that I've, you know, defended him on. You know, he's the one that took down Gawker. But what they did to him and what they did to Hulk Hogan was wrong, so I defended Peter Thiel on that. And I don't begrudge him the money that he's had. Now, some of the money he made, well, let me tell you. Thiel is a venture capitalist who co-founded the CIA-backed data mining firm Palantir in addition to PayPal. So PayPal, you give them. Facebook, you give them. Well, I can make a lot of money, too, if the CIA backs me on a data mining project and says, here, here's a ton of money to go spy on Americans. By the way, this guy's a libertarian. Unless he's making money off of the exact opposite ideology, where they pry into all of our private lives. Mm. And hey, Gawker, don't pry into anybody's private lives. I'll put you out of business. Oh, how did I make money? by having a CIA deal where I pry into people's private lives. <laughs> what hypocrisy. And, you know, when, when asked why he thinks he's right, now this is not according to Peter Thiel, but to sources close to him, he thinks, well, I'm this rich, I must be right. Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. <laughs> I don't find that evidence to be conclusive that you're right about everything, as you're about to see. So what does he believe? Now, conservatives, congratulations, you also get screwed over. 
You thought Donald Trump, oh, no, no, he's on my side. He'll give me a good religious guy who's pro-life, who's this, who's that. If nominated and confirmed, uh, Thiel would be the first openly gay member of the court. Oops. Now, for me as a progressive, wonderful. That's a nice groundbreaking moment. Like I said, it's not a black and white issue, and Peter Thiel lives in the real world, but not in a comic book world where he's just an evil guy or a wonderful guy. Okay? So, but conservatives who thought you were going to get a, you know, real conservative on the court, he's a libertarian, and so he some of the stuff you'll, you'll agree with, some of the stuff you will not. So, for example, in his 2014 book, Zero to One, Thiel praised monopolies, arguing that competition destroys value rather than creating it. Wow, that's going to be news to a lot of conservatives. Really? Competition destroys value? Monopolies are great. Well, first, Adam Smith would disagree. Second of all, every what we viewed to be conservative economic thinker would disagree. This guy is against the free market. He's like, hey, as long as I'm the one getting the monopolies, the monopolies are awesome. By the way, that is also not a libertarian ideology, but I don't think, but some libertarians might disagree. This That one's a little bit more debatable in libertarian circles. Definitely not debatable in conservative circles, let alone sane circles. Okay, uh, now it gets worse. He wrote back in 2009, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Oh, so we're going to put a guy on the Supreme Court who doesn't believe in democracy. He says he's on the side of freedom. That's the freedom for him to get rich without you all getting in his business, right? We're going to put a guy on the Supreme Court who doesn't believe in democracy. You're thinking he can't get worse. It's about to. He also wrote, since 1920, the vast increase in welfare beneficiaries and the extension of the franchise to women, two constituencies that are notoriously tough for libertarians, have rendered the notion of capitalist democracy into an oxymoron. So let me break that down for you. So he's against capitalist democracy, he says that they made it an oxymoron, like that it can't exist. So hence, we've got to lose the democracy part, right? Because when we have democracy, women get the right to vote. <laughs> I, I didn't say, this is a story that comes out of the Trump camp and the field camp. This is, so this guy would go on the Supreme Court, a guy who thought it was a mistake for women to have the right to vote because it would interfere with his libertarian ideology and the profits he would make. Dude, he got $2.7 billion. Take a load off. You're going to be okay. Stop crying already. Oh, they're getting in the way of my libertarianism and my freedom without democracy. Why can't I crush the rest of you guys and take your rights away so I can have $2.8 billion? Okay, final one for you, Ann. On a funny note, uh, he has invested into what people are calling Libertarian Island. Its real name is Seasteading Institute. And they figured, well, all the land is already taken, and we'd like a libertarian utopia where we could all live in anarchy um, and do Lord of the Flies on ourselves. Okay, great. Uh, well, so we're going to, it says that's all the land's taken. We're going to create an island in the sea. He has put over a million dollars into this project, so it's real. And uh, Jonathan Miles, a writer, has described it this way based on their website and their description. There would be no welfare. I get why libertarians and conservatives would be happy about that. Looser building codes, no minimum wage, and few restrictions on weapons. They're going to have looser building codes on an island they're building in the middle of the ocean. Please do that project. Please spend a lot of money doing that project. And please take all of your libertarian friends and put them on that island and weaponize all of them with very little laws and rules. That's a great idea. I beg of you to try it. And you know what, Peter Thiel? You could be a Supreme Court justice on that island, and the president, and the vice president. Have at it, Hoss. You get hours of more content if you're a TYT member. Uh, somebody go get a six-pack. And let's all enjoy it together. TYTnetwork.com slash join. What if 30,000 people download the new app? We're good. Five million. Good. We scale on demand. What if 38 million people download the app? We're total heroes.
scale your business on demand with the number one company in cloud infrastructure. We have some uh, leaked emails of Colin Powell. Uh, DCLeaks.com, apparently connected to Goose for 2.0. I don't know how these guys work. And I don't know who they are. Uh, anyway, they've leaked the, leaked the emails. Yesterday on the program, there was a significant debate uh, among the hosts as to whether we should talk about these emails. Uh, and it, it is a difficult question. So uh, I think that if you have private video of, like, Aaron Andrews, no, you shouldn't air that. And that's a uh, gross invasion of privacy and adds nothing to the national conversation. On the other hand, if you have a leak of, for example, the Apache helicopter video uh, that uh, Chelsea Manning leaked, where we show our guys killing journalists and first responders, well, that you should definitely talk about because that's what our government is doing, and we need to see that. This lies a little bit somewhere in between because it's private emails, it's Colin Powell's personal opinions. On the other hand, it does have to do with an important national uh, issue. So I've decided that we are going to read you some of those emails, partly because, come on, who are we kidding? Everybody else on the planet has shared these emails so uh, we, when you look at all that and the import of it and what we're going to learn from it, uh, I've decided to go forward with the story. So now, uh, and by the way, I think the ending of this story is the most important part and the one being talked about the least as usual. First, let me run through the standard stuff with you guys in case you haven't seen it. Uh, there was a plenty of drama. Susan Rice, uh, of course, uh, formerly um, Secretary of State under George W. Bush, talking to Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State before her about uh, what knuckleheads Don Rumsfeld and the neocons are. She said, first, we didn't invade Iraq to bring democracy, but we overthrew Saddam. We had a view of what should follow if Don, referring to Rumsfeld, and the Pentagon had done their job after claiming the right to lead post-war rebuilding things might have turned out differently. So now, we, we knew some of that drama existed. This proves it. Yes, there were significant disagreements in the Bush administration, and yes, Rice and Powell thought it, like the rest of the country, thought the neocons and Rumsfeld had screwed up Iraq. She was right about that. She also said, she later said Rumsfeld should, quote, just stop talking because he, quote, puts his foot in his mouth every time. Well, good to see our version of reality confirmed by even inside the Bush White House. Uh, Colin Powell agrees, and he says, as you say, the boys in the band were brain dead, uh, referring to the neocons like Fife and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld. Okay. Now, uh, we turn to what Powell thought about Donald Trump. He says, Trump is a national disgrace and an international pariah. And that is Colin Powell, who's worked for countless uh, Republican administrations. So, not uh, good news for the Trump campaign in that, but wait till you hear what he says about Hillary. Uh, he goes on to say about Trump, he appeals to the worst angels of the GOP nature and poor white folks. Now, that is literally true according to the polling. Uh, he does best among poor, uneducated uh, white voters, Trump does. Uh, now, on the idea whether he can win over black voters, Colin Powell says he's at 1% black voters and will drop. That would take him to 0%. He takes us for idiots. Uh, and did Colin Powell believe that the birther movement was a legitimate question? No. He said the whole birther movement was racist. So, Republican Colin Powell, very clear about what he thinks about Donald Trump and the birther movement. Now, we get into more interesting terrain when uh, we get to what he thinks about Hillary Clinton and the Clintons overall. A lot of people have been talking about this. About Bill Clinton, he said he's, quote, still dicking bimbos at home. Now, I don't know anything about that. Uh, all we know is that portion of the email. That's not good news. Okay, we move forward. I mean, it is what it is. I don't have anything more than that. Okay, uh, apparently Colin Powell liked the word "dicking," as you will see in a second. That's the first instance, but it's not the last. Okay, um, about Hillary Clinton, he says, uh, "I would rather not have to vote for her, although she's a friend I respect." Boy, that right there is a great indication of the establishment and how it works. Like, yeah, got no use for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton, uh, I'd rather not vote for her. We can get richer with another candidate. I am a Republican. But, you know, she's a friend. We're all friends on the cocktail circuit. So I guess I'll go with her. Uh, now, this is very interesting. Um, Colin Powell is talking to Jeffrey Leeds. Jeffrey Leeds is a top Democratic donor. Their connection is very, very interesting. I'll tell you uh, why they're connected in a second. Um, he says to Leeds, uh, they're going to dig up the legitimate 
and necessary use of emails with freaking record rules. <laughs> There's a lot I, I'm uh, amused by in these emails, but a cold house use of the word dick and dicking is my favorite. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he's saying, in essence, and this is what most of the press has been focused on, which is, hey, Hillary Clinton, uh, yes, I did tell you, give you some guidance on how you could use a private email, but no, I didn't say you should use a private server, and I didn't say you should use me as an excuse. I find that largely uninteresting. The fact that he's talking to leads is interesting. Uh, we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, but more on what he thinks about Hillary Clinton. He says, everything she touches, she kind of screws, screws up with hubris. Oof, nailed it. Now, that is exactly right. Number one problem with uh, Hillary Clinton is hubris. Ah, I can't lose. But Barack Obama, that guy, that young senator, African-American guy, going to beat me. I'm this thousand, I'm gonna be, oh, kicked a lot, I lost. Everything is hubris. You saw it in that campaign, you see it in this campaign. And he's also right about uh, why she's running and, you know, and what her intentions are and what she's really about. He said she is all about, quote, unbridled ambition. That is so true. Okay. But now we get to Cole Powell's intentions. So one of the reasons that he's angry at her is, according to what he uh, told someone else in these emails, he says, I told you about the gig I lost at university because she so overcharged them, they came under heat and couldn't, I guess, afford or do any more fees for a while. I should send her a bill. Oh, the insiders. What a fun little club they have. You go rob that university, and then I'll go rob them. Oh, you robbed them too much. You took too much money from them at a speaking engagement, leaving nothing for me. Boo, Hillary. Your unbridled ambition has thwarted my unbridled ambition. How dare you, Hillary Clinton? So this is how the club works. But now, finally, let's get to the most interesting stuff. So now this is Jeffrey Leeds talking to Colin Powell. Again, a very important, massive Democratic donor that knows the Clintons well. He explains about Hillary Clinton. She's got trouble, too. No one likes her, and the criminal thing ain't over. I don't think the president would weep if she found herself in real legal trouble. She'll pummel his legacy if she gets a chance, and he knows it. And that is recent. That's 20, some of these emails are, all these emails are 2016 and 2015, these leads to Powell emails, okay? Because when I saw it, I was like, really? I mean, they're having bad blood with President Obama and Hillary Clinton? And I immediately looked at the date. I'm like, is it 2008, 2009? They still haven't gotten over it? No, 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 we're talking about very recently. Wow. Really? I mean, we don't know that Leeds is the most authoritative person on this. We don't know if he's 100% accurate about the president's feelings, Hillary Clinton's feelings. But here's a guy who's connected to all of them saying that the president wouldn't weep uh, if she found herself in real legal trouble. That's an interesting theory. Okay, but he goes on to say this. I think Hillary can't believe she might not make it. It's the one prize she wants. She has everything else, and she, and this is capitalized, hates that the president, that man, as the Clintons call him, picked her ass in 2008. She can't believe it or accept it. Wow. To this day, you're telling me a person inside these circles that knows the Clintons say that the Clintons still call Barack Obama that man? I'm so confounded by the media. I am and I'm not. I didn't... They're all in the same cocktail circuit, so I guess they all want to protect each other. That's a big story! <laughs> That's not a headline? The President Obama and the Clintons don't like each other? The Clintons call Obama that man? President Obama wouldn't mind if Hillary Clinton got into legal trouble? I know that this is not... Don't get me wrong. Just because this Jeffrey Leeds guy said it doesn't make it 100% true. And I... But you're reporting everything else in the emails like they're 100% true. Colin Powell has verified that the emails are real. But they are these people's opinions. But that's an interesting story, but it's almost nowhere. The only place I saw it was Lee Fong at the Intercept had it and Zero Hedge had it. So, that's very interesting. Now, finally, why is Jeffrey Lee's a major Democratic donor talking to Colin Powell so much? Oh, it turns out they have an interesting connection, too. Powell is the chairman of the advisory board to Lee's Equity Partners, an investment firm that co-owns for-profit college Mega Corporation EDMC. 
Unsurprisingly, Jeffrey Leeds is the co-founder of Leeds Equity Partners and is also on the board of EDMC. So they give the Democrats, they give the Republicans, then they get them on their boards, and then they use them for credibility. Now, did EDMC run into legal trouble? Yes, they did. Some of the colleges within their uh, umbrella charged with fraud. The federal government looking into more of those for-profit colleges that they run. But in 2011, Powell appeared before a lobbying association for the for-profit college industry where he gushed, quote, Our society has such a need for education and no field has more to help than career and private sector education. See, this is how the insiders work. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Republican, Democrat, who cares? Just as long as you're an insider. So I need you to come out here and tell everybody how great for-profit colleges are. Then we'll run a bunch of scams, get super rich off of them, and then we'll use a little bit of that money and we'll sprinkle it around. I'll hire you on my board, Colin Powell, and then I'll go give millions of dollars to the Democrats and to the Clintons, and then we'll all have a good laugh over how we're all sharing the booty, and maybe not sharing it uh, enough. You know, ah, oh, the Clintons, they take too much of it. Gee, I wonder why people can't stand the establishment anymore. This is why. You think we're not on to you? You think you're just going to keep on getting away with it? No, we know what's going on. No, it's disgusting. So these emails, they don't help Donald Trump. They don't help Hillary Clinton. But the reason I decided to cover them at the end is because they do help the American people get a sense of how it works inside the club. And it is just as bad as you thought it was. If you're upset with mainstream media, we have the alternative for you. Come build independent media with us. Your membership powers the Young Turks. EYTnetwork.com slash join. What kind of rare loser Donald's section for you? Because this is Donald Trump Jr., uh, but it is going to relate to his father. So uh, here's what he was saying about the media. The media has been her number one surrogate in this. Without the media, uh, this wouldn't even be a contest. But the media has built her up. They've let her slide on every you know, indiscrepancy, on every lie, on every you know, DNC uh, you know, game trying to get Bernie Sanders out of the thing. I mean, if Republicans were doing that, they'd be warming up the gas chamber right now. Oh, don't say that, man. There are no bounds to these guys, man. There's no bottom to this barrel. All right, so the Anti-Defamation League writes, uh, trivialization of the Holocaust in gas chambers is never okay. Uh, they also say to Donald Trump Jr., we hope you understand the sensitivity and hurt of making Holocaust jokes. We hope you retract. Uh, and then Jonathan Greenblatt also with the ADL says, your comment about gas chambers is out of line. Trivialization of the Holocaust is never acceptable. Okay, uh, so, now that's Donald Trump Jr. But remember, his father also has a long history of making, well, if you're being generous, questionable comments about Jewish Americans. If you're not in a generous mood, uh, clearly anti-Semitic comments. Okay, so let me tell you what they are, and then you make your own conclusions. So, according to John R. O'Donnell, who wrote the book Trump, who used to run one of Trump's casinos. So he knew him really well, and he wrote a book about Trump. At one point, Trump apparently uh, told him this. Black guys counting my money. I hate it. The only kind of people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes every day. <sighs> okay. Now, that is... Uh, O'Donnell quoting Donald Trump. Now let's go to Donald Trump in a tweet. No questions, this is him. Never retracted it. This is clearly 100% his thoughts. He says, I promise you that I'm a much smarter, uh, I'm much smarter than Jonathan Leibowitz. I mean John Stewart, who, by the way, is totally overrated. Now why would you use John Stewart's original name? Yes, he changed it from Jonathan Leibowitz to John Stewart. He doesn't hide it. It never hides when he's Jewish on The Daily Show. Everybody who watches it knows it. So why bring that into it? There's only one reason why. And any, look, I, if you're Jewish, you know exactly what I'm talking Nobody says Jonathan Leibowitz. Because they're 
trying to compliment him, a guy like Trump, right? Uh, and says that in the middle of insulting him. That is not the context where you use that in a positive way. Okay? Now, if you're not Jewish, you say, oh, you're overly sensitive, oh, you're triggered, this, that. I got it. I got it. Okay? Uh, but, again, you make the call on whether you think this is or not, and I'll give you one last quote. Um, he went to go speak to a group of Jewish Republicans. Now, he said a litany of insulting things and offensive things. I did a whole video on it at the time. I couldn't believe that people weren't talking about it more. I'll just give you one of about half a dozen things he said. He said, is there anyone in this room who doesn't renegotiate deals? Probably 99% of you. Probably more than any room I've ever spoken in. <laughs> Look, man, this is madness. <laughs> anyone who said things like this would have been eliminated already, but there's apparently Donald Trump can say anything and get away with it. That Saying like, oh, you Jews, you are all hagglers. You like to renegotiate. It goes to all the ugly stereotypes. Stereotypes that led to, led to very, very bad things. But yet, you know, look, I'm not the ultimate arbiter of anything. And so there's guys like Sheldon Adelson who think, oh, that's all right. At least he's a right winger. And so I'll give him millions of dollars. Okay, but don't say we didn't warn you. This is how the Trump family thinks. Yeah, I know Ivanka married a Jewish guy and she converted to Judaism and Trump brags about it all the time. He brags about it in the Republican Jewish uh, gathering too. But that doesn't mean that they don't think this way. It is obvious how they actually take. Buyer beware. You get hours of extra content if you're a Young Turks member. TYTnetwork.com slash join. Go ahead, girl. Jill Stein has come out with an interesting proposal that we should not only free Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning, among others, uh, but we should pardon them, and she would actually make them part of her administration. Wow. Okay. So here's what she said. If elected president, I will immediately pardon Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and John Kiriakou for the important work in uh, exposing the massive system systematic violation of our constitutional rights. I would invite them uh, to the White House to publicly acknowledge their heroism and create a role for them in the stein baraka Green Party administration to help us create a modern framework that protects personal privacy. Now, people in the establishment will look at this and snicker. There <laughs> goes those crazy greens again. But let's think this through. First of all, if you don't know, Kiriakou is the guy who revealed the CIA torture program. So, of course, they put him in prison. Did anyone who actually did the torture go to prison? No. Did anyone who authorized the torture, which now the entire U.S. government says is illegal? No. Even though it's illegal, nobody went to prison for it, except the guy who revealed it. <laughs> Chelsea Manning reveals, uh, in just the Apache helicopter video, let alone all the other things that she revealed uh, were damaging the lies that our government were telling us. In the Apache helicopter video, people are getting shot at. Our guys are shooting them. They're killing first responders who came to help the wounded. Clear war crime, let alone the fact that they mistakenly, and now look, I'll take it that their word that it was mistaken, killed journalists. Also deeply problematic. Did the guys who did those murders get any uh, jail time? No. The person who revealed it, Chelsea Malling, got jail time. And Edward Stone, you obviously know, he revealed all of the spying that our government is doing on us. Now the government admits, yes, it was, we were spying on you. Yes, we were lying to you about not spying on you. The federal courts have ruled that Snowden was right, that this is a violation of our constitutional rights, yet he's still hiding in Russia because if he comes here, we'll arrest him. Goddamn right I'd pardon them. So there is a lot that I disagree with Jill Stein on. I do. There's a lot I agree with her on, but many things that I know. For example, it seems like a wonderful program to uh, you know, get rid of the $1.4 trillion in debt, student debt that everybody has. I just don't think that it's feasible. I don't think it's right. I give you that as context for... I'm not like, oh, the Green Party is right about everything, and I'm, you know, all this. No, but on this issue, where the rest of the press will treat her as a, a curiosity, like, oh, isn't that cute? Oh, and you put them in your opinion, great. Yeah, of course you would. Who knows if more about privacy than Edward Snowden does? Who knows how all this stuff is kept secret? How you could actually keep a secret without guys like Snowden getting in? Well, Snowden does. He's the expert on it. Okay. Kiriakou was in the CIA. Why wouldn't you put him in your administration? He's the guy who told you the illegal things were going on. Okay. And she explains why she'd do it. Because we need people who are part of our National Security Administration who are really...
very patriotic. Again, the rest of the establishment look at that and go, oh, no, 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 I do the time. We put those people in prison. No, they have endangered us, but not the American people. But we'll pretend that it's the American people that they endangered. I know how you think, okay? But the rest of us, the American people, do not agree. We don't agree. Snowden should come back home and he should be pardoned. Chelsea Manning should be immediately free. Kiriakou, immediately free. They should all be pardoned, okay? And I honestly never thought to put him inside an administration, but in my mind and in the minds of a lot of American uh, people, because it's true, <laughs> they are American heroes. They revealed what our government is doing to us and in our name that we do not agree to. Those are American heroes. And if you're looking for someone who knows their material and who are patriotic, it is those guys. So while the rest of the media snickers, on this one, I say Jill Stein right on. And, uh, and way to get me to think about something I hadn't thought about and challenged the way I think. Because even though I want those part people pardoned immediately, and I've always agreed to that, I did not think to include them in the government. But why not? I think they are perfectly suited for that. So that's outside the box thinking. And whether you vote for a third party candidate or not, this is why you should listen to them. Because, hey, interesting ideas might come out of it. Don't get me wrong. There is 0% chance that the Democratic or Republican nominee will do any of these things. You power the Young Turks. We do this all through membership. TYTnetwork.com slash join. Let's build the media that we can believe in. Barbara? You're one hot old El Paso taco Ah, oh, Mom, Dad, I'm right here. Are those peppers? Jalapeno, spicy, caliente. I have got to get my own plate. Anything goes in old El Paso. We tell you all the time about the revolving door in Washington. Uh, they get campaign contributions, the politicians do. Then they retire, and then they take jobs with the same people who are giving them campaign contributions. And boy, there is no better example than former Speaker of the House, John Bader. Now, the rest of the media uh, treat him as a legitimate uh, politician with real ideology and ideas. And, uh, you know, he debated uh, Democrats and also some uh, conservatives in the, in the House uh, that he oftentimes did not get along with, etc. And he's an honorable gentleman, John Boehner. I don't know. All he is is a corrupt politician uh, who did the bidding of his donors. And he did it for money. He never had any ideology. What he had was ambition, and he was there to collect checks and then hand them out, as you'll see in this story. So after he retired, people are wondering when he's going to become a lobbyist. Well, you now have your answer as to who he's going to work for. Uh, today we find out former speaker and unabashed smoker, John Boehner, was elected to the board of directors of tobacco company Reynolds American Incorporated, according to a press release from the company on Wednesday. Now, they, every article that talks about this talks about how he's a smoker. They're like, oh, yeah, John Boehner smokes. That's why he went to go to work in the back of No, that's not why. That's not why. Now, that might be a small, small part of it. The real money, the real reason is the money, Lebowski, of course. But you have to understand something. The tobacco companies have been bribing John Boehner and using him as a conduit for bribes for a long, long time. So over his 14 years in the House, Boehner received $497,112 in direct contributions from the tobacco lobby. So they bribe him while he's in office. He comes out of office. They bribe him now by hiring hire him to do what? What is he? Is he an expert on uh, planting tobacco? Is he an expert on running a company? No, he's not an expert on any of that stuff. He's an expert on how will you bribe the other congressman that you're still buddies with. And if you go back into government, ooh, we're really going to need you in there. That's why they're doing it. So... But there is a wonderful example of how he did this and how brazen he was in this particular case. In 1995, a bill was introduced uh, that would abolish a yearly $49 million giveaway of taxpayer money to tobacco companies. Now, why in the world would we want to take our hard-earned tax dollars and give it in the form of a subsidy to tobacco companies? Hey, it's called a free market, buddy. Good luck with that. Why do I have to subsidize your already profitable company that, by the way, happens to kill people? But leave that aside. It's legal. So go ahead and do it. But you don't need my money to do it. 
you know who agrees with me? Not just liberals and independents, but conservatives. If you're a conservative, this is crony capitalism 101. You should despise this. Don't you hate all those subsidies? And here it is, $49 million subsidy. Well, let's find out what happened during the vote. Well, as the bulletin from Represent.us explains, during the vote on whether or not to do away with the subsidy, Boehner circulated the House floor literally handing out campaign checks from tobacco companies to his fellow members. What? Amazing. Not a care in the world. Not only is he bribing them, he's bribing them in public. Not only is he bribing them in public, he's bribing them on the floor of the House while they're voting! In the middle of the vote! Oh, by the way, here, here's your bribe, here's your bribe, and now, when he gets a job with the same companies that used him to bribe other congressmen, people are like, oh, it's because he's a smoker. <laughs> no! No, no, no! It's because he's a prostitute! That's why! Okay, by the way, his spokesperson back then would ask, well, what the hell were you guys doing handing out checks in the middle of the House for about that vote? Explained it this way. He said, well, quote, the floor is where the members meet. <laughs> the town square is where the prostitutes show up. Where did you want us to hire the prostitutes? In the town square, of course. It's a house of ill repute. By the way, back then, they asked the Republican, Steve Largent, Oklahoma Republican, um, hey, who won on this issue? He said, the people passing out the checks won. And they did. The tobacco companies won, and they got to keep their $49 million subsidy that you and I pay for. And then, they took a very small fraction of that many years later, and now give it as a salary to John Bain. Now you see how things work? If you don't get the money out of politics, they're going to keep robbing us blind, day in, day out, year in, year out. Republicans, Democrats, all of them. John Boehner happens to be the perfect example of it. But understand the game they're really playing. Wolf-pack.com. Get the money out. Get it out, get it out, get it out. If you don't get it out, we're going to keep getting robbed. You can do it. We've already passed in five states. We're going to get an amendment. Wolf-pack.com. Go do it right now. At the Young Turks, we believe in change. We believe we can change the media, make it more independent. Come do it with us. TYTnetwork.com slash join. caught up with Dr. Oz to talk about how healthy he is. And during his on-air interview with Dr. Oz, he also invited Ivanka Trump to show up. Now, Ivanka Trump shows up and gives a kiss, a peck on the cheek to her father. And they have an exchange. Dr. Oz said when uh, Ivanka Trump came on stage, it's nice to see a dad kiss his daughter. And apparently Trump responded with uh, that he kisses his daughter every chance he gets. Right, which is kind of awkward considering some of the incest accusations that have been geared toward Trump. Yeah. Now, now nobody believes, at least we don't think, that he's actually done the incest, but he has referred to his desire for his daughter on three different occasions very, very explicitly. So now, if this is a normal interaction between a normal dad and a daughter, nobody would think twice about, oh, she kissed him on the cheek. Yeah. And he says, oh, I like to kiss my daughter on the cheek. She likes to kiss me. Perfectly fine. Nothing yeah. wrong with it. Yeah. But given his past comments about, I mean, I'd date her, I, I mean, I, I'd date her if she wasn't my daughter. Yeah, like and, and he's like, I mean, come on, she's very, very attractive, and if I wasn't her dad, then don't say that. That's super, super creepy. So now, so no, apparently no one warned him, hey, people think you're a creeper to the maximum degree. You've already said three different times that you might have sex with your daughter if she wasn't your daughter. Can you, don't say you'd like yeah. to kiss her over and over again. So we but don't apparently somebody at 
the Trump campaign realizes it afterwards. Yeah, so look, I, I want to be clear about something. That's speculation. We don't know how it ended up working out this way, but the I, end product of Dr. Oz was that they edited that component out. In fact, we have the video for you. It's edited out. I want you guys to see for yourselves. Take a look. <laughs> The amazing issue that has been proved on child care in this country, and you want affordable and accessible care. See, that seems kind of abrupt the way that he yeah. just went into a serious question, because that's not how it happened in real life. Yeah. Uh, we know that he actually did some small talk about the kissing his daughter stuff, but they went to a shot of the audience, and that's how you do an edit, right? Of, oh, yes, Ivanka's here, and then he's like right into the hard question, because that's not how it went down. And, of course, somebody in the Trump campaign went and told Dr. Oz, hey, listen, we did you a giant favor by releasing our medical records on your goofy show. Yeah. Instead of doing it like a, a real presidential candidate would, release it to the rest of the press, and we gave it to you on a Wednesday taping, thereby making everybody ask you, oh, what did you say, what did you say, until you actually ran it on Thursday, gave you these great ratings. So you'll do exactly what we tell you to do, and you'll take that part out because it's uncomfortable. And so that's, of course, what happened. Look, I, I think there's a more important angle to this story that you're ignoring. How do you feel about the fact that your Turkish brethren uh, allowed Donald Trump to come on his show and spread his lies? Okay, so first of all... Uh, Everybody knows that uh, the best talk show hosts are Turkish talk show hosts. Does everyone know that? <laughs> I heard that Dr. Oz, you know, with his medical advice, you know, gets into some murky territory. Okay, so uh, I talked about Dr. Oz a tiny bit in a video I did yesterday about the same episode because this is my favorite. But one of the things that uh, Trump said in that episode is he said he's really healthy because he does exercise. So well, really, what kind of exercise? His hand motions during the speeches. Did he really say that? Yes. Oh my god. Oh my god, that's so good. That's so good. <laughs> and 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 look, and I so I briefly mentioned this in that video. So Dr. Oz is actually a great surgeon. He's a heart surgeon. He believe it or not, this is funny, he actually operated on my uncle mm -hmm. and did a great uh, surgery. I didn't talk about that in the previous video. And so bless his heart. You know, my uncle's healthy and fantastic and he's and it's not just the weird Turkish thing, he's one of the best, was considered one of the best heart doctors in the country, and he works at Columbia, but this show, he shouldn't have gone in this direction. I mean, he pretty much admits he did it for the ratings, you know, that he was congressional hearing, and he said, look, we gotta, you know, we gotta make it a little bit more dramatic and entertaining, but you can't do that when it comes to health, because if you're not giving the right information, yeah, uh, that's deeply problematic. I mean, because of Dr. Oz, my mom was forcing me to drink, like, beet juice. And oh, I'm yeah, like, please yeah, stop making yeah, me drink yeah. the beet juice, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, no, but it'll fight cancer. No, no, uh, no, it won't. It just no. tastes like shit. <laughs> yeah. Now, so, look, if you want a good takedown of, of Dr. Oz, John Oliver, obviously, did a brilliant takedown of him, and so I don't think we can top that. You should check that out. Uh, but uh, but you're, you're right. Look, the larger, larger issue here is not that it, Trump is a creeper with his daughter, uh, but Dr. Oz, unfortunately, CBS did it with Bill Clinton. Everybody's doing it. Same thing as all of the media. How can I please you, sir? Mm -hmm. You would like me to edit out something that's uncomfortable for you? Well, of course, sir. Right away, sir, as long as you keep giving me access, sir. You know what? I, I, th this is how I believe, okay? I'm from the old school. And the old school is also part of the Young Turks Network. Get the whole network by becoming a member today. EYTnetwork.com slash join. Only those who dare drive the world forward. Introducing the first ever Cadillac CT6. New York wanted to make the internet more accessible to people who might not be able to afford it. So they came out with these so-called internet kiosks. They replaced phone booths, which of course are kind of antiquated at this point, with these so-called internet kiosks. People could go there, they could search the internet, 
They can use it for 411. They can use it for all sorts of things, checking the weather. Well, they have now decided to do away with the web browsing component of these kiosks because too many people were utilizing it for pornography. Of course! Of course they were! They were also spending a little too much time at the kiosks, so people were concerned about loitering. Well, they were very excited at the kiosks, very excited, very excited. Then all of a sudden they would lose their excitement completely and then they would go away. <laughs> so, according to Mashable... And they were being a little too loud. A lot of this was overheard. Ew. Ew. Okay. Anyway. They promised Wi-Fi spanning a 150-foot radius, free domestic calls, two USB charging ports, <laughs> a 911 button, and a tablet for accessing the internet, and were designed to replace old-school phone booths. Well, now they won't have the internet option, okay? The kiosks have been so popular with loiterers and the lascivious that their operator, Link NYC Network, has said it's shutting off web browsing on its built-in tablets. The kiosks are often monopolized by individuals creating personal spaces for themselves, engaging in activities that include playing loud, explicit music, consuming drugs and alcohol, and the viewing of pornography. The viewing of pornography. I love how professionally that's put together. Yeah, that's Corey Johnson, a New York City yeah. councilman, who said that last quote. Um, so, look... It sounds like a wonderful idea, and I, I love the idea of replacing the phone booths with something that, as they were saying, bridges the digital divide. And they're like, look, and it might help people who don't have as much money, yada, yada. But I can't believe they didn't think this through. Yeah. I, I think I, that I, I, if I was in the meeting, I would be like, uh, I got to point out something to you guys. <laughs> you know what people use the internet for? <laughs> uh, but, and it's not just the porn. People started watching Netflix on it. Yeah, yeah. And then they wouldn't leave. And they're watching it all day long. Or they play loud music. And people are like, we got to go to bed. Okay, York's loud, not enough. Loud music is a problem. Netflix, okay, so if you're poor, you don't get access to Netflix? No, but it's a different thing when people are camping outside of your house all watching Netflix. I don't know. It's I know, but it's New York. <laughs> people are camping outside of your house anyway. Well, that's fair. You see what I'm saying? Like, I get it. The loitering is troublesome. But you're in the big city. There's people outside your door constantly, right? The porn is a problem, but aren't there blockers? Can't they find a way of blocking the porn sites? Yeah, you know, I, I've seen that happen before, uh, and I I imagine that there are ways around that, but usually 9 out of 10 guys won't be able to figure that out in the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. So i try that first, because, yeah, I mean, look, it is a great idea. It, it would be nice if people could, like, if you're in a jam, you could plug uh, your phone in and get it charged. Yeah. You know, certainly the 911 is helpful. You can make free phone calls from it. That's wonderful, and you might want to look something up. But I actually think the larger problem, even if you had the porn blocker, and even if you, nobody put in the next book, somebody needs a Netflix code, right? Mm -hmm. So, and one guy didn't do it for the whole neighborhood. Whatever it is, like, you get yeah. past all those problems. I still think it's a bad idea, because it's going to lead to fights. Because at some point somebody's going to say, "Hey, I want to watch my movie." Somebody's going to say, "I want to watch my porn." I want whatever, and then then people are going to start to fight. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? It's yeah. like you put anything free out there. You put a stack of hundred dollar bills. I'd people, fight for that. Yeah, people are going to fight yeah. for it. You but, see what I'm yeah, saying? I do. I do. I, there needs to be a smarter way of providing internet access to people who might not be able to afford it. Um, yeah, maybe so, this isn't the right way. So, bless our hearts for a bold, interesting idea. Didn't quite go in the right direction. I hope that they reformulate it and come up with something else. Because I, I don't want to get on them for trying it. I don't want to be like, huh, huh. No, it was, it was, a, it was a, an idea headed in the right direction. It veered in the wrong direction. Because people are people. That's, that's reality. Mm -hmm. There might be more fights, too, if this hits on your shoe. If you get Young Turks membership, you have a camera up your nose. <laughs> That's not really true, but we do, because everything gets recorded, our behind the scenes, our post games, all sorts of new shows, all at tytnetwork.com slash join. We'll see you there. A bus driver in Maryland saved 20 school kids from a burning bus, and... and it's a pretty incredible story because she went into the bus one by one to save every single child. 
Now, uh, according to reports, Renita Smith was the bus driver, and for some reason a fire started on the bus. Apparently it began on one of the rear wheels, and it's currently under investigation. 20 children from um, Glen Glenarden Woods Elementary School were on the bus when the blaze started, apparently originating near one of the rear wheels. One of the parents posted about the bus driver on social media and said the following, uh, Renita not only took each one of the 20 kids from the bus one by one, but also went into the empty bus again to check if everyone was out while it was still burning. She apparently also said, I'm a mom of two kids. It's my job to save them. Well, <laughs> I, I love that she thinks that, and I love what she did. Um, I know some people who say, hey, it's not my job to save anybody else. It's my job to get home safe. I know. Let's not. Okay. All right. So, anyway, bless her heart. Uh, that's the kind of bus driver any parent wants. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Like, what she did is so heroic and so amazing. She put her own life at risk on at least, tw no, 21 occasions just to make sure that everyone was safe. And all those kids are safe now. By the way, we have video of it. Like, let's oh, yeah. let's take a look at the B-roll while we discuss this, because you'll get an understanding of how dangerous the situation really was. Would oh, you walk my, into that bus? Oh my God! <laughs> so you might have thought from the reading of the story that it was like, oh, a small flame by the tire. Okay, not a big. No, no, that that bus was on fire. Yeah. Wow. Now look, she might not have walked in when it was like that. But it was headed in that direction, and she still walked in anyway. Do you think you'd walk in there? If it was like that? Uh, i got to keep it real. I think only if my kids are in it. If it's that bad. Because you, you're not... There's an excellent chance you're not coming out of there. Yeah, yeah, right? of course. And so I hope that I would be as decent as her. And if the fire was smaller, I hope that I'm a good enough person to walk in and save other people's kids. If it's like that... You're, I mean, you're done. So yeah. I mean, the only way you do it is in desperation to save your own kids. Yeah. I, I don't and even so, you probably won't, right? Jeez, can you imagine? What a terrible situation. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Renita, for not only doing this, but giving us all a little bit of hope that there's goodness in the world. At the Young Turks, we believe in change. We believe we can change the media, make it more independent. Come do it with us. TYTnetwork.com slash join. Uh, a classic case of who done it. Luckily, Jay choose Triton to help clean and protect his teeth, so he can claim his innocence with a convincing grin. That's it, Jay. They'll never know. Triton, cherish your teeth. Ivanka Trump lost her composure during an interview with Cosmo. Now, that's Cosmopolitan Magazine, and one of the reporters had the audacity to ask her some tough questions about Trump's policy on paid maternity leave, and uh, Ivanka Trump did not like it. Yeah. So, the person who was interviewing her is Prachi Gupta. I want to give her uh, some credit, because these were great questions. They were not gotcha questions. This is not, what is it, hit-and-run journalism, as some conservatives claim. Uh, Drive-by journalism. <laughs> yeah, Drive-by journalism. I don't, it's still I don't even know what that means. But nonetheless, these are good questions that you would expect from the Washington Post, New York Times. In this case, Cosmo was asking it. Now, here's uh, what happened. Now, Donald Trump's Ivanka-backed plan proposes <coughs> six weeks of paid unemployment benefits for women who physically give birth to a child paid for by cutting fraud in the unemployment insurance system. It does not include any paternity leave or leave for a mother who adopted her child or whose partner gave birth. So I just want you guys to understand exactly what his proposal is before we get to the questions that were asked of Ivanka during the interview. Okay, so just let's just quickly go over why that might be problematic, which is going to come up in the interview. So guys don't get any paternity leave. So by the way, if you're a gay couple, uh, uh, two uh, you know, husbands, you don't get you're not part of this at all. There's no at family all. leave. Sad day for you. If you're a man, you're not covered. If you are a woman who didn't physically give birth, you are not covered. This is specifically for women who give birth, and that's it, which I think is unfair, okay? Mm -hmm. It takes more than just a woman to raise a child. So anyway, yes. but let me move on. Okay. So here's the, the question that Gupta first asked. 
Paternity leave is said to be a great factor in creating gender equality. So I'm wondering, why does this policy not include any paternity leave? Ivanka Trump responds, This is a giant leap from where we are today, which is sadly nothing. Both sides of the aisle have been unable to agree on the issue, so I think this takes huge advancement, and obviously for same-sex couples as well, there's tremendous benefit here to enabling the mother to recover after childbirth. So she says, obviously for same-sex couples as well, except no, it's not so obvious, because if the person in the same-sex relationship didn't <coughs> give birth, then that person is not covered under this proposal, right? And besides which, it's not, as usual, it's not true. So she says, oh, no, no, neither side of the aisle has proposed anything. No, Hillary Clinton, for example, has proposed giving 12 weeks of paid family leave to new parents. Uh, also, by the way, dads. So yeah. she actually looks out for men more than Donald Trump does. So she has absolutely proposed it. It is a much better proposal than Donald Trump. And as usual, a lie from a Trump family member. Yeah, and the way to pay for it makes more sense than, I'm going to pay for it by going after welfare fraud. That's well, how he says he's going to pay for every program. I know, I know. And, uh, every single program, welfare fraud, welfare fraud. How because, much welfare fraud is there? By the way, not does, that much. It, not that much, but that argument does well with conservatives, right? Because this is supposedly a liberal plan, and how do you sell it to, sell it to conservatives? You go after welfare, right? Yeah. And so anyway. look, it's not to say there's no fraud. By the way, there's giant fraud from corporations who also take giant subsidies and welfare from us. But even if you took the much larger welfare fraud that we give to corporations, it's still nowhere near enough to pay for all the things. Whenever Trump asks any proposal, oh, yeah, you give a $10 trillion tax cut, literally, how are you going to pay for it on welfare fraud and inefficiency in the government? $10 trillion? Really? Guys, just, he doesn't care. And Ivanka is a, you know, is a pleasant face that they put out there. But, like, women, look at this. She's, she's a woman. Yep. And then she's here to tell you all very, very pleasantly these sweet little lies about how they're going to take care of you. So there's more. Um, the reporter follows up her answer by saying, okay, so when it comes to same sex, and I guess at this point Ivanka uh, interrupts her and says, so it's meant to benefit, whether it's in same sex marriages as well, to benefit the mother who has given birth to the child if they have legal married status under the tax code. So there she's a little more specific, but now you're kind of getting a sense that the proposal from Trump is not really that comprehensive. It wouldn't impact the lives of too many people, right? And that's also her way of saying, okay, yeah, fine, fine, we cover lesbians, but not gay dudes. Yeah. So uh, Gupta continues. In 2004, Donald Trump said that pregnancy is an inconvenient thing for a business. It's surprising to see this policy from him today. Can you talk a little bit about those comments and perhaps what has changed? She says, so I think you have a lot of negativity in these questions. And I think my father has put forth a very comprehensive and really revolutionary plan to deal with a lot of issues. So I don't know how useful it is to spend too much time with you on this if you're going to make a comment like that. So everybody gives Ivanka Trump all this credit for being modern, unlike her dad. She's not at all modern. It's the same thing Donald Trump does. Oh, uh, yeah, I know these questions are very unfair to me. They're very unfair. I'm going to cry about these questions, right? And so this is, uh, by the way, this is the most comprehensive and uh, revolutionary plan that's ever been. Based on what? It's actually a weak sauce plan that is much lighter than the other plans that have been proposed. Yeah. And then now you're getting all touchy because they actually, they the ask journalists you ask question. you a real question. Yeah, so I, I want to focus on that, like the broader, you know, point to this story. Now, Ivanka is just a symptom of what I'm seeing in the media, and it's this idea that you go to an interview and you're expecting people to, like, sit there and have tea and crumpets with you. You're not expecting anyone to ask you any tough questions. You're expecting them <coughs> to allow you to do some free advertising. This is my free advertising ad free advertising opportunity. Don't ask me tough questions. And if you do, I'm going to cut the interview short, which is exactly what she did. Now, Gupta followed up by saying, I would like to say that I'm sorry the questions, you're finding them negative, but it is relevant that a presidential candidate made those comments, so I'm just following up. And uh, she apparently said, well, you said he made those comments. I don't know that he said those comments. Okay, that's what Ivanka said. Yeah, that's what Ivanka says in response to uh, Gupta, which is a very Trump-like response. Well, I don't know if he said that. I mean, he's my father. And I'm campaigning for him, but I don't know if he said that. And those words came out of his mouth, but then other words came out of his mouth later. So Gupta followed up. This is quoted from an NBC interview from 2004. I definitely did not make that up. I do want to talk to you a little bit 
beyond the plan as well. And she says, I think what I was, there's plenty of time for you to editorialize around this, but I think he put forth a really incredible plan that has pushed the boundaries of what anyone else is talking about. Not true. On childcare specifically, there are no proposals on the table. Again, not true. Not remotely true. So Ivanka Trump obviously getting upset about all this, and then, you know, she decides, well, I've had enough of this. Uh, it turns out, shockingly, um, even though NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, all these other places I've ever gone on, all they've ever done is toss me softballs. Uh, turns out, of all places, Cosmo is doing real journalism. So, no, I, I, I won't stand for it. And uh, she left. She left. She, left. Yeah. she walked out. So, I mean, this is what our sorry state of journalism has come to, that you need Cosmo to step up to the plate because the rest of the mainstream media is so pathetic in their quest for having the Trumps on and access to the Trumps. And by the way, definitely to the Clintons as well. I just did a story the other day about how CBS edited a, a Bill Clinton interview to take out things that he didn't want in the interview. So we're left with Cosmo. And so God bless the reporter here. Wonderful job. Really good job. And by the way, how did the rest of the media respond to this interview? Well, Forbes put out some sort of editorial. And the title of it was, Ivanka Trump showed Cosmo how a person with class behaves. What? Hold on. Oh, but they, they deleted it. Now if you click on that link, you get a 404. Gee, I wonder why they deleted it. Maybe because they realized that is a ridiculous argument to make. A journalist should do his or her job by asking questions regarding policy to anyone affiliated to a campaign, right? And by the way, so we're giving uh, Prachi Gupta a lot of credit here, and, and she deserves it because she's outclassing the rest of the media. But these are not complicated questions. These are not like, wow, I really dug in here and found someone something that nobody else had found. These are all public record. Everybody has them. I, I know that uh, he said those things. Anyone who does any cursory re research on this. But our state of journalism is so pathetic that when you just simply Google something and you find out what he said in an interview and you ask that simple question, it's like journalism 101. Yeah. Uh, the, the people in the establishment are like, how dare you? Don't you know we're above the law and we're above getting asked uncomfortable questions? I'm never going to come... It, get interviewed by you guys again. I'm never going to appear on these shows again. Look, they have the power because they have the access, but the media shouldn't be obsessed with the access. If, if you can't get the interview, that's fine. You can still do journalism without getting the interview. But they believe they can't, by the way. So, so and last thing about the power dynamics, because it, it is what's driving this. Cosmo probably thinks that this is the one shot they've got, in this, certainly in this election cycle, right? Uh, with a Trump, with a Ivanka Trump, whoever it might be. So you might as well take your shot. CNN thinks, i got to get them on tomorrow and, tom and the day after that, etc. And if I don't have them on, nobody will watch me. So what do you need? Yes, sir! Absolutely, Mr. Trump, sir! Yeah. Uh, you, would, you would like me to hire your former campaign manager who's still on your payroll and is legally not allowed to say anything bad about you. Yes, sir! You'd like me to pay him a lot of money? Absolutely, sir! I'll hire Corey Lewandowski right away, sir! So, this is how we have the sellout BS media that we have. They suck at their jobs. There's so much more content if you're a member of the Young Turks. You get the post games, you get live interviews. I forgot the other things you get, but they're awesome. TYTnetwork.com slash join. A California teen refuses to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. In fact, she alleges that she stopped standing for the Pledge of Allegiance a long time ago as a Native American student because her parents taught her about her Native American history. Well, because of what's been happening with Colin Kaepernick protesting by not standing during the national anthem, uh, all of a sudden teachers are noticing the student. Her name is Lilani Thomas, and she goes to Lower Lake High School. And apparently, a teacher noticed that she wasn't standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and docked a few points from her partici participation grade. Now, this made headlines, and it got to the superintendent, and the superintendent has responded. But first, let me tell you what Leilani Thomas says. She, meaning the teacher, told me I was being disrespectful, and I was pretty mad. She was being disrespectful to me also, saying I was making bad choices, and I don't have the choice to sit during the pledge. Now, the superintendent weighed in on this and said, no, no, no. 
she has all the right in the world to not stand during the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, she has the right to, you know, protest it or make whatever political statement she feels is appropriate, which I agree with. But what's interesting is how much our schools go out of their way to ensure that kids don't question authority and don't think for themselves. Don't be a critical thinker, because if you are, if you offend anyone or if you're considered disrespectful, then we're going to um, cut a few points from your grade. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ironies here. First of all, we're really being talking about disrespectful. Um, you're saying a Native American must pledge allegiance to the American flag. I mean, you're in a school. Have you read any history? Like, look, I, I love the country, and I want to put all... There's been great parts of the country, terrible parts of our history, and I'd like to get beyond all that, and so I love America, and I, I stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. But if a Native American says, hey, you know, given what's happened... Uh, I'd rather sit this one out. I get it. <laughs> I mean, if you don't get that, this you got an issue. And so, in fact, I'd find it a little disrespectful to say, no, remember that flag that uh, rode, uh, you know, roughshod over your ancestors and killed them and butchered them and then reneged on every deal we ever made with them? Make sure you salute that flag. That's a little disrespectful. And besides which, again, the more important point is you're missing the point of the country. Look at the positive things about that flag. Is our Constitution, our ideals, and what we stand for, which is freedom. And the freedom to express yourself in any way you like, including sitting for the Pledge of Allegiance. Right, exactly. And I think the most important thing to take away from it is understanding that no progress in the country came from people refusing to challenge authority. Right? I mean, anytime you've had progress, it's because people questioned authority, they challenged authority, and they demanded better of the country and the people that represent us. We should educate young people to be like that. We shouldn't educate them to shut their mouths and follow all the orders and all the rules. I know that a lot of adults and educators want that because it makes their jobs a lot easier. I mean, that's, that's how you discipline kids. But at the same time, when you see someone trying to make a political statement at a school, Try to nurture that conversation and that dialogue. Like, I would utilize that as an opportunity to do a lesson on, on the Pledge of Allegiance, where it comes from, why does this Native American student feel this way? I mean, maybe that's like a hippie stance, but I think it's a good educational no, it's not opportunity. it's a hippie stance. It's a stance of an educator where we actually talk about the issues and, and learn from it. Right. And, but instead, well, what are we doing? She's been sitting since second grade. But because of Kaepernick, there's a hysteria. I know. Like, oh, my God, find out all the sitters. Who's sitting? Okay, the sin has hit the fan. Okay, let's all make sure we go on a warpath, ironic, and go get these people. Yeah. Just calm down. Let her voice her opinion, in this case, by not voicing her opinion, and just sitting. Become a TYT member today. Can't do it. No, you really can. You just go to tytnetwork.com slash join.